Phonology. Phonological rules. In this particular video, we're going to be going over how phonological rules work in languages. And in particular, we're going to be looking at types of processes that we can group these rules into. So the idea is that when we're looking at languages, part of the analysis that we need to do is to try to figure out how things get pronounced. What are the phonological rules that lead to that phonetic representation? And if we can look for certain likely patterns, types of rules, it's going to make it easier for us to do the analysis. So first of all, the way the phonological rules work is you start with the phonetic, pho, sorry, you start with the phonemic form, that is the mental representation, and then there are going to be a series of rules that lead us to the phonetic form, that is the physical manifestation, how we actually say the sounds. Phonological processes is a way of typing these phonological rules. They are common processes that we see in language after language. And at a higher level, we can group the processes into two main types. So there are these two forces that are at work in language in general, and this is not specific to phonology, this is going to exist all the way across grammar. But the idea is that languages seem to operate with economy, that the speaker doesn't have to work any, doesn't want to have to work any harder than they need to, and the hearer doesn't want to have to work any harder than they have to. So those two forces can be in op opposition, but together they lead to the amazing communication system that is language. So from the ease of production side, the speaker aims to produce utterances that are easy to say. And from the ease of reception side, speak, the speaker aims to produce utterances that are easy to understand. The first process that we're going to look at is assimilation, which is going to be an ease of production process. Assimilation is where a sound becomes more similar to a neighboring sound. And by doing this, you can intuitively just see that that's going to make it easier on the speaker, right? They, they are going to have to do fewer gestures, basically. So for example, if you are assimilating the place of articulation, then you don't have to move our tongue or our lips or whatever it is any more than is necessary. All right, so one example that we can see in English is called nasal assimilation, where we start with an N, which is an alveolar nasal, a voiced alveolar nasal. But that N sound, when it precedes, stops, it will take on the place of articulation of whatever stop follows it. So for example, I can throw. In that case, you're going to get an N, so it's going to be the alveolar, because that's the default. But if the word that immediately follows it starts with a bilabial, like bat, then you're going to end up with the M instead. I can bat. I can bat. And now you may be thinking to yourself, I don't pronounce it that way, but I bet you do. And, and uh, one of my students came up with this test. So she was arguing with some friends of hers who were saying, oh, no, I, I don't do this. I, you know, I, I always pronounce the N as an N. And she said, OK, what, what is the, the name of the association that's in charge of professional basketball? And immediately the people said, oh, MBA. And they pronounced it M. And because in our speech, we make these sorts of assimilations without even thinking about it. It's not conscious. We just say it. And so you have to get somebody to say a word quickly without thinking about it. And then you'll hear that assimilation. So I can bat. 
is probably the more common way of saying it. now, in careful speech, you can say i can bat but i don't think people say it that way most of the time or if it's a velar then like as in catch then you're probably going to say it with an mm sound instead i can catch i can catch and again you could say it i can catch but that's going to be less common all right another process that's sort of the inverse of assimilation and probably slightly less common is dissimilation which is going to be an ease of reception process because it e makes it easier on the hearer to make it out so for example when you've got a t coming right before an n sound then at least where i come from you're going to get a glottal stop instead of a t sound so for example the name of the town north of me is leighton leighton it's an sound and the reason would be because would be because that n that comes right after it is alveolar then that t can get lost right so then it makes it easier for the hearer if i turn it into a glottal stop latin insertion is possibly going to be an ease of production or ease of reception and it really depends on the environment. So in some environments, it makes it easier for us to pronounce it if we insert something in there. And in some environments, it's gonna make it easier to understand if we insert something in there. So this is where a sound that is not present at the phonemic level is added. So for example, and I, I talked about this briefly in one of the previous videos, if you have a sibilant immediately before the plural, then we will insert a schwa there. That schwa is the uh sound. So, for example, you've got the word judge and you want to make it plural. You add the plural z, but then you insert a schwa in there. So it comes out judges. And the reasoning would be that it's probably a little bit hard to pronounce that judge and then go straight into a z, judge z. Or it could be that it just makes it easier to make out that there is a plural there if we've got the schwa. And maybe it's a little bit of both. So then it ends up judges. Deletion, of course, is going to be the inverse of that. And this is usually an ease of production, that sometimes we will delete sounds to make it a little easier for us to pronounce the word. This is going to be where a sound that is in the phonemic level isn't represented phon phonetically. So in other words, we don't pronounce it. So for example, in the words hunter, hunter and 20, which in careful speech, I would pronounce the T, in fast speech, I usually would just say hunter. He's a hunter. And 20 would usually come out 20. So in that case, the T gets deleted right after an N. Metathesis is where the order of sounds at the phonemic level are changed at the phonetic level. This tends to be an ease of production. There tend to be certain patterns that are easier to pronounce and some patterns that are harder to pronounce. And for some reason, the s k consonant cluster is harder for us to pronounce than the k s consonant cluster. And so the word ask often gets changed to ax. So instead of saying ask, you would say ax. I gotta ask you a question. Strengthening tends to be an ease of reception. This one I think is, is a hard one to intuit, what we mean by strengthening. And for now, I'm just gonna say that linguists have identified that some sounds are considered stronger than other sounds. So for example, voiceless sounds are considered stronger than voiced sounds. That um, an aspirated stop is stronger than an unaspirated stop. So for example, in English, voiceless stops are aspirated when they begin a stressed syllable, as in kick. And this is probably, again, an ease of reception. It makes it easier to hear that K that there's a, a clear voiceless K there and not a G if we put a little bit of aspiration right after the K. 
and that way you can tell that we're saying kick and not gick. Weakening, of course, is the inverse again. This is probably an ease of production phenomenon. So as I said, there are some sounds that are stronger than others, so weakening would be where we make it weaker. So that would be, for example, when we voice a consonant that would be underlyingly unvoiced. Um, and a flap is going to be weaker than a stop. And a flap, the d sound, is also weaker than the t sound because it's voiced as well. So for example, this is a, again a particularly American pronunciation, but we take the word ladder. And in that case, you've got a D underlyingly, but it becomes a flap, ladder, ladder. And likewise with the one ladder, which sounds awfully similar, but is spelled with a T, and phonemically it is a T as well, underlyingly. And in this case, it also gets pronounced with a flap, ladder. So in this case, it's our alveolar stops become flaps in that uh, sorry, after a stressed vowel and before an unstressed vowel. So alveolar oral stops become r after a stressed vowel and before an unstressed vowel. That's a weakening process. So again, the purpose of these is to help us make hypotheses when we're analyzing data.